Welcome, everyone. It is um, September 15, 2021. It's 6 p.m. and we are at the Fairfield Center School, and this is the Maple Run Unified School District Board of Directors meeting. Um, we're going to review the agenda. Um, so, I have a um, couple of changes I'd like to make to the agenda. Uh, and it's really just the order of things so that we can release people on a cascading basis. So I'd like to move um, item 5 A and B to after 7 B because we have a discussion in 7 B related to the minutes. I'd also like to move 7 C envisioning plan to what was five, so it'll be like five C, renamed five C. Aaron, does that make sense? When you listen to the recording, it will. <laughs> so those are, the, <laughs> those are the changes I would like to make. So I need a motion to approve the changes of the agenda, with, as I just made for the agenda, please. Is there a Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thanks. We have a motion and a second to approve the changes in the agenda. I guess I need to take, can we do it this way? But I, can point, I guess I committed myself. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, I need to take a vote. Uh, Peter? Yes. Jack? Yes. Nina is not here yet, right? Right. Uh, Alicia? Yes. Katie? Yes. Joanna? Yes. Susan? Yes. Grant? Yes. And Al? Yep. Thank you for, for doing that. Uh, let's see, please join me for Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. Where is the flag? Oh, God. <coughs> Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, All right, thank you for that. <clears throat> All right, visitors. Do we have any visitors that are going to want to see? Madam Chair, just as a, a continued point of order, and that is, uh, at one point I had requested that people, when they speak or when they sign in, state their area of residency. And if you go to the Maple Run public participation at board meetings, it says, under persons who may address the board, it says, any district resident. And I would say that unless they tell us where they live, we don't know where they live. And it may be implied that they're from the district, but I think that it's much easier and up front if they just state their area of residency. Um, and like I said, that's already part of the policy that says any district resident may speak. You could almost read that two different ways. The resident of any district. But I don't think that's what it means. I think your point is taken. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, so do um, you have any objections? Any input on that? Does that make sense? You recall I, the. Well, I think the, I think the policy is trying to drive home that you're a resident of the three towns in which sounds as city, cities that we serve. Um, so city, town, and Fairfield. Right, that they <laughs> want to see that residency. I see it two different ways, but that's the way the policy is stated. I believe that we are trying to see ourselves as one as Maple Run. I understand Peter's point that you need to be a resident. So I, I, if I understand you, Peter, correctly, you're just wanting to make sure that whoever's speaking is part is a member of the Maple Run district, Absolutely. not necessarily a member of. Yeah, I don't care which one, but that they're a member of the district. <laughs> Okay, well, you did cite the policy, and I think we have to abide by a policy. So hearing that, um, we'll, we'll proceed in that manner. Um, are there any, just before I read the visitor section, are there any people here that wish to speak that know they're going to want to speak? We can't hear you very well. Well, where, where's that microphone? Oh, the mic. I think there's a microphone. Is the microphone dead? It's just for recording. <clears throat> All right. I'm going to yell. Okay, does anyone in the room wish to speak in the visitor section? 
I'm seeing none. Does anyone on the um, Zoom wish to speak in the visitors section? Yes, Has anyone have, signed in? We have two so far. Uh, <laughs> we have Dr. Jen Williamson followed by Briar Erickson. Okay, so I'm going to read my visitor preamble. Uh, the public comment visitor section of the meeting is an opportunity for community members to address issues of concern about policy, budget, or administrative man matters, or to share ideas about how we can work together to improve our schools. We value input and respect divergent views. We ask you to limit your remarks to the time constraints prescribed by the chair and refrain from airing grievances with individual members of the school community, including respecting the privacy of the students and parents. Those attending remotely may type their full name in the comments section if they wish to speak. During the meeting, the comments may be disabled. So we have two um, folks in the Zoom session that wish to speak. Um, I'm going to set my timer for two minutes, and I am going to cut you off at the last sentence that you finish with, at two minutes. So please abide by the rules, folks. And let me find my timer. OK. First person on the air is? Dr. Jen Williamson. Dr. Williamson. Williams. Can you guys hear me? We can. Yeah, OK. Your sound is terrible, and I cannot hear anything that anybody was saying up until I heard my name. Like, it's all just very garbled and like a lot of like um, staticky noise. It's really like we won't we won't get any information out of this tonight at all if the sound doesn't change. So that's just like thing number one I wanted to bring up. But um, I just wanted to thank you again for um, enforcing the mass mandate in school and now bringing up the uh, the uh, testing uh, that's going to be coming up. Um, I'm just concerned, you know, for the, the nursing staff and, and how they will be able to handle all of that extra work um, from what I read today that it won't be a few weeks, it'll be a few more weeks before it gets um, passed. So um, I'm very excited about it, uh, making sure that we're on top of things going forward, just, you know, getting um, COVID to stay out of the schools as much as possible and not get transferred for the kids to bring home. Um, I'm very excited. So thank you so much for doing all of that work. It's really appreciated. I see other um, other districts not uh, doing so well and that there's a lot of misinformation in the in the public sphere. So it's it's nice to know that we have a really strong board behind us. So thank you again. Um, and then just lastly, I'm very excited to finally hear uh, the plan going forward for the liaison program. Um, and yeah, just, I can't wait to hear the details and how it gets hashed out. There was a, 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 a show on Northwest Access the other day in which the mayor seemed less than um, friendly about the whole situation. He seemed like it just wasn't uh, something that they were going to help help to participate in and, and they were just kind of poo-pooing the whole thing. So that was quite disappointing. So I look forward to hearing um, Superintendent Kimball's uh, plans to go forward and to get this actually accomplished to, to see all of our hard work come to fruition. So I didn't have planned uh, comments tonight, but I did want to say those few things. So thank you. Our next speaker should be Ryer Erickson. Ryer Erickson. But go along with what Nina's been saying, I heard clearly. That's all. Al, can you, can you hear us now? No, I can hear you better, yes. So it's using the computer microphone, so you'll just have to project. Okay. Is, <clears throat> is Ryer on the other end somewhere? Uh, can you come to me? Yes. Okay, I think you can speak. He can't hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. We can hear you. Okay. Um, I, I, want, I wanted to just speak a little bit about, um, yeah, the sound is pretty bad. I agree with what's been said before, but um, I, last week I had the opportunity to um, testify in front of the task force on the implementation 
of the pupil waiting factors report. Um, and they have a couple more meetings coming up. There were a number of superintendents, a number of school board members there. I don't think I saw anyone from Maple Run representing, which was disappointing considering um, St. Albans City Schools, one of the poorest schools in the state. Um, but they were just, uh, the, the task force, in case you're not familiar, is making a recommendation to the General Assembly on an action plan um, and proposed legislation um, that will ensure all public school students have equitable access to educational opportunities. Um, it's a really, and it's gonna be presented, I think on December 15th of this year. So the next upcoming meetings are the 8th of October, the 20th of October uh, is a public hearing, the 29th of October um, and a few more into November and December. Um, it would be great to have a few, uh, to have the superintendent or even a few school board members present and to testify on um, how the state can do a better job of um, allocating funds based on the weighting factors. Um, and also, I, ju I just want to say again, I, I really hope that the, that the school board and district takes serious the anti-bias and anti-racism training in a district that's getting rid of the equity committee when most other districts are actually um, bolstering their, their plans and, and, and um, ability to provide equitable access to education and, and that kind of thing. It, it's disappointing and it's a little, it so makes me a little nervous as a, a black parent that there is such a kind of running away from that kind of stuff. So I just would encourage you guys to really move on that going forward. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else in queue? Yes. Anyone else need to speak? All right. Thank you all. <clears throat> thank you. Okay, we're going to go to what I've now labeled item 5C, which was item 7C, which is the envisioning plan. And I'm going to turn it over to, I think, John Muldoon and Alexis Hoyt. Sure. Are we able to have the speaker be next to the laptop so we can rotate so folks can hear on that? Can yeah, try thanks. that? Sorry. Thanks. Not at all. Um, so if you give me one minute, I'll have uh, Sorry. the presentation up. And related fields. 
Um, I'm not going to go too far into detail on any of these. I'm going to prefer to let my uh, colleagues who are experts in individual areas give you some updates on what's happening there. That is the 30,000 foot view. One thing that is important to talk about just as a general framing, uh, teaching and running schools is, is part science and part art. It's not all science, so we can't um, just run with things right away. Sometimes we have to go a little bit slow at the start so we can build capacity um, and, and iterate and, and go faster and do better in the long term. And that's very much the approach that Maple Run has taken. So we've been working with um, committees that represent different members of the school communities and teachers and staff that um, are embedded in this work day to day to engage in some learning and discussion about um, this specific work and then what it would look like at its highest form in our schools. Um, and so you hear a little bit about that as well. And so uh, this idea of the design cycle of uh, you know, learning, uh, articulating, getting feedback, and then iterating again is one that all of these committees has, has embraced and is a good general framework as you, as you can get uh, all the information. And so with that, I will introduce the SEL team. Well, I'll introduce Alexis White. So I will just quickly introduce um, the two members of the committee that so graciously offered to dedicate their time to join me tonight and just do a co-presentation to you all. So we have Susan Boslin, and Susan Boslin is a school counseling coordinator at our Career and Technical Center. So our focus is really grades nine all the way up through adult education. And then we also have Ashley Olio, who is the school social worker for BFA. So again, her primary focus is high school, so grades nine through 12. If you go to the next slide, all right, so this was taken right from the envisioning work that we had to do for the Agency of Education and the plan that we submitted to the AOE. And um, I, I'm not a fan of reading slides, so what you'll see under there is the theory of action for our social emotional learning domain is really primarily focused on connection and belonging um, and creating school climate and a district climate that is focused on those two components, not only for our students, but also for our staff. And then our overall purpose and mission that we review before every committee meeting, so it continues to be at the forefront of our minds and the work as we move forward, um, is that our mission is to develop equitable and restorative social and emotional systems across the district. So again, pre-K all the way to adult <coughs> education. Again, who are we? So we are a staff um, committee, and um, these are all folks that have um, a passion and a dedication to doing systems level uh, work in the area of equity, social emotional learning, and restorative practices. If you look at this list, um, I hope that you can see not only is it representation from every single building in the district, but again, it also has representation from pre-K all the way up through adult education. So we really intentionally tried um, to make sure that we have folks at the table that have a diverse perspective and are coming from um, different roles. And we do have a classroom teacher on the committee as well. Can you just explain those stars? Oh, sure. So you'll notice that there's kind of an added feature of the stars that are next to some folks' name. Um, so those stars represent um, individuals that have been on the equity committee in the past, um, and we're continuing that work in the social emotional committee. So again, as you'll see as we move throughout the presentation and the slides, it is called a social emotional learning committee and domain but it's really a braided approach and we feel really strongly that it's an integrated approach with restorative practices, social emotional learning, and equity. So um, this is a staff committee that is diving deeper into all of that work. So we're carrying the equity work that has been done in the past um, forward. All right, 
so speaking um, of equity, uh, one of our benchmarks that we um, created for ourselves for the summer, this summer that has already passed, is to develop an aligned district definition of equity. So when we use that word, um, we felt strongly that we needed to have a shared understanding on what that meant and how that was defined. Um, we are still diving deeper into that process, so we have not completed that benchmark quite yet. Um, but I just wanted to make the board aware the Vermont Principals Association um, just recently um, came out with a model policy that they are encouraging school districts to adopt. Um, that is not only an equity policy, it defines equity and then it gives implementation. shift gears and kind of move into the work that we're doing around restorative practices. Um, one of the benchmarks that we created for ourselves for this school year is um, defining a minimum standard of practice that we want to see in all learning environments for restorative practices. And what we quickly found out is um, we can't really talk about standards of practice until we do an assets and needs assessment of where we are at in our individual schools and as a district uh, in the area of restorative practices. So in an attempt, full disclosure, to be totally transparent, this is one of the benchmarks we're bumping forward and we're not gonna meet our initial timeline. Um, we're partnering with restorative practice specialists to really help us um, pioneer this work and the first step is really looking at our data. Um, and doing um, an asset and needs assessment on our buildings and on ourselves as a district, and then that will determine where we need to go and um, what standards of practice we can put in place. So I think um, I'm gonna pass it over to Ashley, who's gonna continue talking about the short practices. Hi everyone, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, and so there are six benchmarks for guiding restorative practice work within our district. Um, the number one is centering student voice. That's going to be a vital component to this process, um, as, as well as engaging the community, staff, family, and connected stakeholders. The next is trauma-informed practices will act as a foundational guide um, for utilization of restorative language, processes, policies, communication, and cultural considerations. Next is utilizing the data that Alexis just talked about to inform decision making, plan professional learning, and measure implementation um, with the acknowledgement and grace of knowing that there are many um, paths forward and that Maple Run commitment is there um, and we will continue to assess those approaches as we go along. Next is social emotional learning um, and Susan's going to be going over the Castle competencies shortly. Um, and that just goes along with how the restorative approaches, sorry, <laughs> the restorative approaches are intersectional. So that's what Alexis was talking about before. Um, these practices are extremely um, connected, braided, and overlap in imperative ways. Um, the next is essential structures are developed and revised to hold the work in sustainable and equitable ways. And last but certainly not least is the lens of anti-racism, diversity, equity, empathy, and inclusion in all of the work that we're doing moving forward. All right, so it's really important and one of the huge benchmarks that we have to complete the um, FY22 is getting at least um, a minimum of 10 restorative practice trainers um, throughout our district with one trainer in every building and just building that team as a district and then within the buildings as well. Um, we are utilizing IIRP, which is the International um, Institute of Restorative Practices, which is a really strong um, and pivotal program to restorative practices overall. So, next is Susan, who's going to talk about the castle. Good evening, everyone. Can you all hear me? Yes? Okay. Um, I'm here to talk about... So you have to push it forward. Oh, thank you. A little arrow over. There you go. You got it. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm here to talk about the Castle 5, and I'm delighted that um, the community, the 
district uh, decided to adopt the Castle 5. I learned about the Castle 5 when I was taking an IIRP program, um, a class on RP and social emotional learning. And Castle is embraced nationally, if not internationally. And they have this wonderful wheel framework. It's called the Castle Wheel or the Castle Framework. And I think you can all see it in your hand. <laughs> okay. Um, and it, it really makes sense for kids as young as preschool all the way up to the adults in the building. The Castle Wheel teaches us to pay attention to our self awareness. It teaches us once we better understand ourselves how to manage. It then allows us to make better decisions and develop better relationships because we are less aware of our social awareness. So um, I think they hit some five really important points. What you don't see here, but you may see in your handout, is that this is done in conjunction not only in the classroom with the teachers or with the guidance counselors or social workers, it's also done um, across the school. We hope to involve families and caregivers and communities. So it is a very thorough, thought out process. Okay. The process um, really helps everybody identify healthy identities, manage their emotions, achieve personal and collective goals. Empathy is so, so important. Um, we're really trying to help people become successful humans, not just successful learners. We want people to have a good sense of themselves and others, and that's super important. We know from research that this improves behavior, it increases stress management, better attitudes about self, um, so it's really, really important work, and I'm delighted that we're, we're partnering in with restorative practices and equity. Um, it will help us to build a safe and healthy community. And that's all I have. Are there questions? Pardon me, wait. Okay, wait to the end. Okay, I'll wait to the end. I'll pass it back to you. Thank you. Thank you to my friends from the SEL committee. Um, I'll just introduce a little bit of the framework we used when it came to looking at math and literacy, uh, pre K to 12. And, and so I, I always like to use a quote to, to ground us. And so if you're not able to read it as a packet, this is a Robert Marzano quote. He's one of the big name researchers in uh, education. It says, a guaranteed and viable curriculum is the variable most strongly related to student achievement at the school level. Um, and that, that speaks to the real importance of schools focusing on a curriculum that is guaranteed and viable. And those words are, are actually really important. Um, the guaranteed one, I think, is pretty easy to figure out. When we talk about our curriculum, we're making guarantees about what it means to get a Maple Run education, what all kids are going to have access and be supported to achieve. The viable piece is one that sometimes doesn't make sense um, to people, and I love to talk about this. So when the Common Core was first rolled out, uh, the language around it and the initial approaches were about this idea, you know, all kids, all the standards, and, and we're gonna we're gonna run through it in this very like sequential, logical, from one to the next to the next pattern. And Robert Marzano did some research uh, through the Marzano Research Institute, which is what's his name, right? He's in charge of. Um, and uh, the initial findings on that that he came out with is that teachers taught that way it would take 22 years for students to get a 12th grade education and actually get all of that, uh, get all of the common core content. And he's actually since had to revise that. It turns out he was a little inaccurate the first time. It's actually 23 years. So it's, it's an additional year. And so his institute pivoted and really led some foundational work on how do you develop a, a curriculum that actually can guarantee the Common Core, but do it in a way that's viable, that teachers and students can actually meaningfully work through all of that, uh, all the skills, the content, and the, the knowledge we expect students to have. And so that has informed some of the work that we've done. Um, we have uh, an incredibly talented group of teachers that represent all of our Maple Run uh, uh, schools that have Common Core associated classes. Um, and so you can see their names 
um, here, and I'm so beyond thankful because um, they actually gave up. We didn't have very many perfect summer days this year, and it felt like every day we met this summer, it was a perfect Vermont summer day. I, I just really appreciate the sacrifices they made. And uh, we had four outcomes. I'm sorry for the screen. <laughs> uh, the first outcome was around this idea of a curriculum template. So everybody here knows the, the history of uh, Maple Run as a district. Um, schools had been operating a little more independently over time, and the curriculum had been built and developed and is taught a little differently in all of our buildings. Um, and so one of the key pieces of the envisioning plan is for us to develop a, a common template to address that. The second outcome, um, one of really the most important ones, is this idea of articulating, developing and articulating high leverage concepts. These are the foundational building blocks for when we talk about what we guarantee for all kids, right? And, and when it's not happening for a kid, we stop on a dime and pull out all the stops to make sure that it does happen. And so Kyle, uh, in a minute, will tell you a little bit about that. Then outcome three is about assessment. And so uh, assessment is a, a really key and important piece. And we make, we're making agreements across the district about how we'll approach um, certain parts of assessing student learning, both to inform teaching, again, with that theme of how we're going to guarantee student learning, um, around teacher reflection, how teachers can reflect on the data they generate and, and learn and grow, um, and also for us as a district, how we can monitor our success in delivering on these promises we're making. And then the fourth part uh, is talking about teacher standards and practice. This is the beginning of a big conversation for, for Maple Run. Um, and how we articulate and identify that model of instruction that we aspire to, that we get feedback to uh, staff members based off of, that teachers reflect and learn and grow based on, and, and that we use to inform our narrative across the district. And so I'm actually going to invite Kyle to come up, and he is going to tell you a little bit about the uh, approach we utilize for high level concepts. Okay, Kyle, I'll the Matt Peter City School. Um, so as John said, high leverage concepts are the foundation of building blocks that students need to perform at each grade level. Um, they'll give us clear, targeted directions for intervention and special ed support, uh, but it's important that those are not the only thing being taught. Those are just where we're going to put a majority of our eggs in that basket. Um, they also help us create some horizontal and vertical alignment, not just within the schools, but also across the district, which as we completed our needs assessment, we found that was something that we really needed. Um, and as we kind of move out of this, into this recovery phase and out of, out of the pandemic, one thing that we learned is that we gotta keep it small and then grow from there. So this is really gonna help us do that. Um, our Maple Run approach was, uh, we kind of got together and we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. So everybody in each school had some form of, form of high leverage concept. So what we wanted to do was bring everybody together and take a look at what everybody had, compare it, and then also compare it with some research-based ideas. Uh, the high school had already been doing this work, so their job kind of was to just take what they had and refine it. Uh, the K-8 schools was kind of a little bit of a bigger task because we're kind of combining a whole bunch of different things. Um, There's two major sources that we referenced, especially in the math. Uh, there was Achieve the Court and then the All Learners Network, and the, all the K-8 schools agreed that we were going to adopt the All Learners Network, all, uh, high leverage concept. All Learners Network is a Vermont-based um, program that a lot of people who teach at VMI, um, got together and they created this foundation to provide PD for Vermont teachers to help educate all children. Not just the children who need the extra supports or the high flyers about every child. Um, and so there's a lot of familiar faces in that program, which I think led our group to kind of in that direction. Um, the other good thing about the All Learners Network High Leverage Concepts is that they also provide you with a lot of resources and assessments help support that work, which gave way to some of our um, assessment agreements that Helen's going to talk about. Um, so these are just some of the, the math high leverage concepts uh, that we established. As you can see, there's one or two, basically, at each uh, on grade level. It's not a lot. We're going to put all our resources into making sure that every kid in each grade level, by the time they leave, is proficient with these high leverage concepts. Yeah, 
here and the literacy coach at Salem um, Town School. Just as the math folks got together and developed high leverage concepts, literacy people did that as well. Um, so we are represented by pre-K all the way up through high school. Um, and that's been very important um, as we take a look at trying to unearth some common assessment agreements. Um, we've been doing lots of assessing across our district in the past. Unfortunately, it always hasn't been the same assessment data that we're collecting across the schools, and that makes it really impossible to sit down and have a common conversation together because we're looking at different information. So that's our goal, is to find what assessments really help us learn what our students know related to the high leverage concepts um, and other pieces that we agree all students in our Maple Run district ought to know. Um, so over on the side, you'll see just a very long list. What is at the top are some kindergarten assessments, and then I just selected grade four and grade eight, but they actually go pre-K through grade 12. Um, what we would like you to notice, um, especially past the kindergarten year, because that's low assessment, they're just coming into school and they're, they're looking at different things. Um, but vertically, we're looking at the same assessments over time, but at different levels. Um, so you see things like looking at reading comprehension, looking at spelling, looking at writing in all different genres, okay? Um, and we see that throughout the grades, so that not only can we have a conversation between SATEC and SACS and Fairfield, and the high school about how are kids writing opinion or how are kids writing information pieces. But we can look, how does any individual student grow across time? Because we're looking at the same assessment measures. So that being able to work together has been like really essential and just so helpful um, in coming up with this list. Thanks, Bob. Um, it's important to note, so these are just two components of the work on curriculum. That's where we focused a lot of time and energy this summer and the start of this year. Uh, our curriculum is actually still much bigger than these components that we um, that we share. And, and there's a, multiple stages of prioritizing and sorting and scaffolding for, for student learning. So this is, this is the beginning of that work in alignment for us. Um, and it is, I mean, it's a ton of work. <laughs> Uh, but it, it's great work and to see you know kindergarten teachers talk with high school teachers who teach the same content but at totally different levels and to watch the conversations they have about kids and content is really it's really powerful for them it's amazing for me to watch uh, uh, grow. so uh, Alan gave you a little bit on, about what that process was like at the end I don't know if you wanted to yeah I think, I think anytime that we can get together across schools uh, there's a lot of smart people in our district. So if we can bring more minds together, uh, we, can, we can do good things. So I hope that we continue to go forward and we continue to work together so we can increase the consistency of the law Thank you. Uh, it's, it's important to know that the teachers did share, the teachers on the committee shared that they, they felt really proud of that work and were really motivated about it. And they've been back in their buildings um, having these conversations with their curriculum teams and, and getting people uh, started on it. So the last thing before I open up for, for questions, um, I do have some resources that um, I, both Alexis and I thought we would share to start to build a common language. Um, I love the first one. It's very provocatively titled, Teach Less, Learn More. Um, but it is related to that theme I, I mentioned at the beginning of having a viable curriculum. Um, and then the second document is a, actually a document created by a member of one of our curriculum teams who engaged in some synthesis of the Marzano work on guaranteed and viable curriculum to give us a concise document to use as a team. Um, and so it's not as polished as maybe the other article, but it's definitely worth a, a read. Um, and then Alexis, I don't know if you want to um, preview your two. Sorry, I ran away. Sure, so the, the first one is um, just a really quick read. I think it's four pages, mostly visuals around the CASA framework. So that gets more in depth as to the definitions of each of those five domains and uh, gives examples of what self-awareness or self-management would look like in students. Um, and then the last one, which you do not see, is just a really quick, fast back document on social-emotional learning and how, it, how important it is to have that be a focus 
Yeah, so I'll, I'll pause there. I don't know if board members have any questions for Alexis or I or any of the members that participated. Um, so we're happy, happy to talk about it. I just make a statement as a former teacher of 42 years, I know that teachers, like every other skilled person, take ownership for their craft. It's very difficult to get a group of them together and agree to do things differently. So I, I, a, I appreciate the effort, and I think this is a great idea, but I understand how hard it is. Thank you. I have a question, and maybe to Alexis or anybody else who might be here who was on the equity committee before, um, I know Stacy is on the list as well, but um, do you feel that the equity work is continuing? Is this the right next move? We're hearing from the community there's concerns around discontinuation of the equity committee, so how do you see this work supporting our efforts of inclusion? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I absolutely see the equity work continuing, and how we started the conversations in this committee is we actually took all of the notes and all of the information from the prior work that has been done, and we talked about how do we continue to push that vision forward. Um, so we're not restarting, and we're not doing it new with a new group of people. We're continuing the momentum that has already previously been established. And um, what we found is, you know, this initially started as we need to put a focus on social emotional learning and restorative practices. And we quickly found that we can't do any of that in a silo. We can't be working on social emotional learning in one way and then doing restorative practices in another way and then doing equity over here in another way. They all need to be graded and they all complement one another and they're not initiatives. It's just good teaching and it's good education. Um, so that's where we made the decision of we've got to find a way to blend this so it's viewed as one vision, one framework, um, kind of where the district is moving, we're intentionally not using the word initiative. Um, so that's why we made that decision. And I'm glad you asked that question because what I hope you've heard repeatedly in the uh, presentation, I fully own and acknowledge that the standing committee members are all staff of people run. However, again, we are not doing this work in a silo. So we are just starting the work and we cannot do this work without student voice, without parent voice, and without community voice. So there are going to be continuous ongoing opportunities to pull in diverse perspectives um, and different folks at the table to help us do this work. This isn't going to be a top down of we're going to make decisions and we're going to tell people what to do. It's a collaborative um, decision making process outside of the state. Thank you. So I think this relates to your outcome number three, um, the local assessment agreements, which I believe is in a way sort of the objectives of the program that are agreed at the various levels and across the schools. Um, what do you have feeding in to that system to ensure that you are targeting the correct objectives, um, you know, the long term? Uh, is that something that is within the scope of this team, or are you working with other teams to make sure you're working, you're moving the right direction? Uh, so, uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> For all of it. Uh, so, uh, all of the assessment agreements are not the only assessment assessing that we have. Teachers are assessing constantly in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Uh, for us, we're, we're focusing on the things that are most important to articulate and guarantee across the whole district. And so the assessment agreements are linked to those high leverage concepts and prioritize uh, content skills. Yep. Uh, and so, and, and some of them are, are new, uh, depending on what building or Peter mentioned, you know, teachers get really attached to certain ways of doing things, and that is, is certainly true of people run. Um, and so we have people who are getting outside their comfort zone and the school's going to be providing training and support for uh, new tools or different ways of assessing um, as, as we move forward. And we have quite a large number of teachers who are going to be piloting new uh, forms of assessment in their classrooms so we can collect this data and then actually feed it into a tool where we can look at it, uh, teachers can look at it at the classroom level, um, people can look at it at the building level, we can look at it at the district level. It's, it, it's quite common for schools to be uh, uh, data rich but information poor, and so we're focusing our assessment agreements and data collection on those pieces that are most and most important right now. Uh, but that doesn't preclude teachers from assessing and gathering other data. 
Okay, and so is the importance assigned internally, or are we using outside sources to tell us what the important things are? So uh, a little bit of both. So in both teams, we're connecting to the outside resources that we have, and it's different for every team. So in, um, in math, the All Learners Network is a Vermont-based uh, group that has done incredible work that we've been able to, to draw from. Um, literacy is a little less unified, but there are still great outside um, resources that we've been able to, to connect to and, and draw from. Uh, and then we also draw from what we have here um, as a district. So a key piece is looking at how we sequence courses over time and looking at what the high school program looks like actually can have an impact on the way we might structure things at the uh, elementary or middle school level. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a mixture of both. Thanks. Um, I don't even know how to formulate my question. Um, so that was a ton of information. Yep. And some of it is concrete and some of it is kind of fluffy. Um, and I guess if you had to, um, if I was a brand new board member that didn't know, I am, I don't know anything about any of this, but. How would you articulate to me what this is replacing that we currently have? Is it just beefing up the curriculum and changing the assessment tools to have better data? Or I don't want to put words in your mouth, but give me like the thumbnail of it. So, this is, so I, I'll be clear. There's there's not a like we're not reinventing the wheel or um, dramatically changing the lives of the students and teachers in the classroom. Um, this work in math and literacy is really focused on being consistent and very intentional about what we articulate as the most important things students will learn in every classroom uh, in every year that they're with us. So in a, in a way that we haven't done before as a district, this is talking about the guarantees, how we're going to uh, actually articulate that we guarantee it, know that we've actually guaranteed it, and then what are we going to do when we find out that we, we did it. Um, and it's not happening for a kid. Um, so this is that's really the boiled down version of, of, of what it is. Um, and, and related to that is learning and building capacity um, in Maple Run. So schools are learning organizations, and all of this work has to be coupled with um, an intentional process that teachers and community members can learn about it, build the common vocabulary about it, and know what to do uh, when things aren't going right. Thank you. Did I, did I summarize all right? Sounded good. Okay. <laughs> Anyone else have a question? Jack. So, your early statement from uh, Marzano about takes 22 years, it just made me think of the time factor in learning. Um, and in my experience, time is a factor that we often uh, don't pay attention to enough. Uh, some kids, uh, when I coached football, some kids learned to play the very first day. And some kids, you had to keep teaching them for, uh, you know, 16 weeks. So <clears throat> it's the same with, uh, when I was a music teacher, some kids could sight read the piece right off, and other kids, <laughs> It took 16 weeks to teach them. So time factor, how has that entered into the work you're doing with the teachers? Because kids are all over the place regarding how long it takes them, you know, yeah, so in my experience. No, and and that, that's true. No, no two of us learn exactly the same way or at the same speed. Um, and then when you put a, a group of anywhere from 14 to you know, 20, 28 kids in the classroom that multiplies exponentially. Um, so you know, teachers really are uh, miracle workers in the sense that they're they're addressing that in the classroom every single day. Um, what this does, so if you think about the curriculum as a funnel, we start with all of the content skills, and then uh, I'll simplify. But there's a, a level of prioritization, and that looks a little different in, in each of the buildings. But that's something that we're also talking about in these committees. Um, and so that's where teachers really focus the, the majority of their instructional time over the course of the year. And then we have the high leverage concepts as those really most focused pieces um, 
for the park for the student experience at the grade level and of course. So what that does is that gives the teachers uh, a new level of focus and because we're supporting that work with tools, that means um, if, if I'm in your class and Aaron's in your class and um, he got it you know, on day one, right? Um, you, you know what's next for him and you can support him in moving forward and then you're differentiating for me because I need a little bit more time on a high leverage concept or a prioritized concept. Um, and so that, that clarity and focus for teachers is really important because it, it can be daunting to figure out on your own. Um, but then also having the, the tools to support that. So uh, you know, sometimes it's a, it's a platform of like getting that data back quickly and, and knowing what's actually going on in the classroom and, and how to respond to it. Um, in other cases, it might be support from an interventionist. So it, it, it depends. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you so much, all of you, for your presentation. Thank you. I, I did tell our teachers that they could just get out of this. Well, I don't know. Thank you very much for that, guys. They don't want to stay for the whole <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'll project. I'm pretty good at that. Uh, I just want to remind the board, and you know, I'm glad John gave you the articles and the PowerPoint that this, we'll be using this next week in our retreat. What you learned here, because we've been talking about direction, is something that had to be done very fast, as you all know, because of the ESSER grants, the recovery grants, and we had to put something together. So please see this as one of those foundations. I'm gonna talk later about the retreat, what are supporting materials, but this is one of them. It was purposeful that this presentation happened before then. Thank you. You guys, can you tell, is Nina here now? Yeah, okay, I thought so. I just wanted to make sure for the um, minutes. Maybe. All right, um, so the next item on the agenda, we're going to move to the revised agenda, is the retreat update, and Bill's going to take us through that. Yeah, so I think I just started that. I should have been looking at my agenda. Um, <laughs> couple things about the retreat. It's happening on the 22nd at the boardroom. Uh, a couple days prior, you will get a email from Aaron asking what you'd like to eat. We're going to order off a Tetro's menu. Uh, a little different than last time. We're also going to, um, I sent you an email about 5 o'clock tonight that had a chapter 4. Some of the best governance work has been done in the Commonwealth countries, and this is from Canada about um, some of the work that the board has identified for, for us to do that we did last retreat. But um, it, I like the reading from nonprofits, and it's a nonprofits governance piece, and it gives questions to board members, they call them directors, but board members to ask of themselves and of the board. So you'll see some key questions in there. I also took the VSBA self-assessment survey for boards and created it into a Google form. And I'd ask that everyone takes that prior to the meeting. It will help us inform our discussion about what work and what reports we need to do. Because remember, this is about getting to reports. And so that's the objective of the retreat. Mike Dewees could not join us. He's been able to go up to his house in Canada, so he's up there through the month. Uh, but Bill and I, and working with Nina a little bit last night, talking about the agenda, and get to that place of, we wanted to get to a place of a board, a yearly calendar for the board, and that's what we're trying to get to. I set uh, the agenda, which I put at your table, I just gave it to you today, really around that. Um, and then we'll look at our mission that we have, and how do we use that mission to drive the reporting schemes for the board. And is there something missing in our mission that we should go back and look, or do we have what we need there to do that work? And that's really, for me as your superintendent, that's really something the board needs to determine. Be able to give you a report and tell. And ju just to add to that, when we found out that, that um, our consultant couldn't be with us, I was really pretty sure that I wanted to keep going with our timeline because I don't want to lose our momentum because we, we had a good meeting a month ago and I didn't want to lose that. So we will reserve the right to pull him back in after we have this meeting to kind of help us put it back together. 
So just so you all know that, we're not like, you know, just washing our hands of him, but we just did not want to lose time, especially with these reports that we want to start seeing on a regular basis. So thank you. Thanks, Bill. Yeah. Anything else on that? That's more on that. Okay, next item on the agenda is um, a thorough update. Yep. A lot of information too. I do have a lot of information. Um, so I want to thank my leadership team colleagues. I gave to you in your packet district liaison duties. And so we as a team put this document together. Um, it has what the duties are. It has some of the working conditions on it. And then we still have some questions uh, that we're figuring out for ourselves. Um, and some things that we need to do in MRUSD. Uh, with our own staff. So we really kind of took the work that you had directed us from Essex, looking at that and then saying, what's this work that staff members need to do? And what is the work a district liaison would do? And do we have capacity to do that right now within existing staff or do we need other staff for that? Uh, so that's the work that's happened. I will tell you that I started to discuss with the city about supporting the district liaison. And I'm going to suggest to the chair that we have an executive session for ne contract negotiations at the end of the board meeting so I can talk to you about how those negotiations are going um, with the city. And uh, the last piece I would say to you is that one of the things that we have found is that in at BFA, um, and this is some of what Essex has on staff, is that um, we're going to need a school safety worker, so 1.0 FTE, to help with uh, promoting a safe environment for students and staff through their presence, visibility, and relationship building, uh, and having a strong working relationship with students and, and staff. Um, it is something that we've done the job analysis of the work that's happening within that building. Um, and we were, you asked as a board last meeting what resources. I don't need you to go look for resources. We can find them within the budget to do that. Um, I just wanted to alert you that we're going to be starting to post for that position. And I'll uh, be taking over some of the SRO duties along with some other duties that need to happen within the school. And that person will have a strong mental health background. I was just going to ask. I knew you were going there. I could see you <laughs> sitting up straight there. Uh, but that's where we're going. And Alexis has been one of the main players along with Casey in putting together this our HR, our HR coordinator and Alexis with her student support background and putting this together. I think you have to help. Al, can you hear me? I can hear you now. Why don't you speak out? Okay, sorry about that. Um, the timing of board meetings. Oh, yes, so thank you. Is that, uh, is that person going to be? Uh, district wide, or is that person that's going to be at BFA? So, um, at the other buildings, we feel we can handle it, we don't need additional staff. Um, and the other thing that I will need is because we will not get, I won't have finished negotiations tonight, that's one of the reasons I need the executive session. We will need a board meeting somewhere between Monday the 27th and Wednesday the 30th, or that might be the Thursday the 30th. Uh, because you gave us an October 1 deadline to me and for you to ratify the memorandum of understanding. And we can do that as a special meeting via Zoom for one item agenda when that is it ready for us. Yep. As long as we get a quorum available. Could we do a special meeting just prior to the retreat next week? I'm not, I can't guarantee that we're going to be ready for the retreat. Okay. It's an option, but okay. it's an option, but I can't guarantee it. If okay. I could, if I could do it, then I will, okay. yeah. but I can't guarantee you that. So I'm guaranteeing the last yep. days to meet the board's timeline, but to let you know, I've got to, I've got to have some, some time to finish work. Understood. I'm That's halfway good. through the month for the deadline you gave me. So well, and, and Bill has been very committed to meeting mm -hmm. the deadline, so we wanted to give him the grace to be able to make that work. So. Can I just state that as I read through that, it hasn't changed since this afternoon. I, I just, I was somewhat, no, not even one, I was more than somewhat disappointed in the fact that I, I didn't see any time or space for a relationship between law enforcement and students. 
I, I didn't see any time for that interaction, which, which I felt was the strong point of the SRO program, and I understand that that was voted against, but I just don't see any space in there for the relationship. It seems like there's an officer down on call, and when they need him, they call him, and I'm wondering, how's that different than just an officer on call? How is this different? Might be a good time to make the motion to move uh, the discussion to executive session. I, I need to do that in executive session. Yes. Um, Sorry, I can't. I okay. can't yeah. I can't well, the, the negotiation piece of where we're at because we're in negotiations right now. Okay. I think we have a finding that we could move it into executive session because premature public knowledge would place the board committee at a substantial disadvantage due to the negotiations of the contract. So when we get so we'll, later, we'll. We take already that. have that. We don't have to. We'll take that. Okay. Action. Thank you. All right. Uh, we are now. Uh, we'll continue that discussion later. And just, just a point of order. Yes, sir. Order. Yeah. I can't hear anything that anybody's saying. Uh, it's garbled. Uh, if we're going to discuss the uh, proposal, I think we ought to do it uh, table at four tonight because the sound is terrible coming up. Okay, we're, we're going to make a little technical change. <clears throat> so I do move the table it to our next meeting. Uh, hey, Albert, Albert, Al, we're going to try to um, make a change oh, here. The problem becomes it's not consistent. Mm -hmm. So when they start talking, it reminds me of a typical teacher educator. When you sit in the classroom, have the strain to hear them. Uh, <laughs> first two or three words are fine, and then it drifts off into the oblivion. So we're going to uh, make a change here. We're going to pass around a, a separate computer to pick up the sound. As board members are speaking. So we'll just need cooperation from the... Yeah, you're going to have to mute those speakers. Turn that speaker off. Okay, turn it off. So we can't hear it now. So I can, we just... Can we, do, can we do a quick timeout? Do technicals address the issues? And then why is it... Because we got to... But it should be going back through your USB. <laughs> Is there still an access setting on your but there's nothing wrong with the audio coming to the camera and no artifact I can tell that is changing anything from this board to your computer. I have no idea what's happening. So I'm happy to offer my computer up as the mic computer and we can pass it around and the sound is now coming out of well, let's try that. I mean, it seems like it's a it's an option. Should we keep checking in with Nina and Al and make sure they can hear? So, Nina, Al, Mike, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, well, we might have a, a solution for now, <laughs> hopefully. Um, so, Al, I don't know if you picked up on the, the, and Nina, I don't know if you guys picked up on the discussion, but we're going to have an executive session related to the SRO um, to talk about contract negotiations. Yep. Okay. Okay. Well, it's, it's that whole premature discussion will put us at a disadvantage in the public. Um, so now we're going to move on to item seven on the agenda, which is the COVID update. And Bill is going to give us the COVID update. Yeah. Um, I'm going to try to be brief about this. I'll take any questions. Um, at our at our last meeting, I had let the board know we had had 12 cases. And we had had a really quiet time since then, maybe one or two cases until today. Today we had five cases that put out four classrooms, so we probably have over 50 or 60 students. I don't have the total number uh, quarantined right now as of today. Um, one of the things that's getting tough in most of the schools is some of the contact tracing and the requirement of if you're with the students for four hours, 
you're automatically quarantined. So in our elementary schools or people that are in pods, and it's very different. Luckily at the high school, it's, we have a lot of students vaccinated, and so we're, a lot of kids and staff are able to stay in. But at the, anyone, especially under 12 years old, that's where most of our quarantine's happening. So um, that it's, I think there's just more of a reality on the ground with COVID and the contact tracing. I know that our fellow neighbors uh, and their supervisory units have cases greater, a case load greater than ours, even though they might have a student population of half of ours. So I think even though we had a spike today, we're still doing pretty well. And folks are doing really well in the schools to keep the kids safe. So to me, that's the real positive. We have a much bigger population than a lot of our neighbors. So uh, while the case count, we're at 19 now, might seem high. I know, like in Joanna's district, it's much higher than that for the whole Franklin Northeast. And so it just, it's half, you can see that on the dashboards in different districts. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is that the employees have been great in getting in their vaccinations and exemption uh, requests. We're right now, as of today, by this Friday, they have to have it in. We have 82% of our staff in as of this meeting have turned in what they need to turn in. Uh, we're gonna start tomorrow with individual emails to folks. We've been doing reminders. Um, we've had six exception requests out of 560 staff members. So I think that's pretty good. Uh, people are doing really well. We're gonna process those exemption requests uh, next week. I'm waiting to process those till we get to the end of the period to turn in their vac proof of vaccination or exemption request. Uh, and I just, I can't thank my colleagues, especially the ones, our teachers and uh, ESP staff in the schools for all the work they're doing. They're constantly working to keep our kids safe, whether it's keeping them in pods, cleaning, uh, you know, ensuring kids have masks on. Uh, I, was in, I was in the tech center today and the kids were doing great. So uh, they're learning their, they're focused on the learning. They're glad to be, everyone I talk to says they're just glad to be back with their friends and back with everyone there. So. Thank you. Anyone? Um, I was just gonna ask a question. I think I know the answer, but in the school system, if a student has had an exposure, we're recommending that they get tested or just quarantine and wait it out? Or, or it, it depends on the situation. Okay. It depends on the situation in Melbourne. There's no one blanketed answer. If the contact tracing, which most of my principal colleagues out there know very well, uh, it says it really depends on the situation in which if someone gets tested or if they are quarantined and how that works. Because the CDC just changed that recently to testing now for high risk of exposure. And yeah, but Vermont hasn't changed their pieces. Yeah, Vermont hasn't done a lot with this right now. All right, anyone else have any questions for Bill related to COVID? Recently, recently, Grant. They haven't done a lot recently. I, I'll, I'll clarify that. Um, okay, next item on the agenda is item 7B. This is the board meeting minutes discussion. So I received a request from board member Peter Delorier regarding our um, the content of our meeting minutes. And I'm gonna turn it over to Peter to let him express his concern, and then we'll have a discussion and find out what the, the will of the board is in regards to minutes. So, Peter. Thank you. Just be careful. Don't the hit the middle no, or the like screen. I almost did. <laughs> okay. First of all, thank you very much. Uh, and what I'm mostly concerned with in the minutes is how we handle or have handled the visitors' reports. Um, I know that we, had, as a board, had briefly spoke about the fact that we would like to change the tenure a little bit to make it a little more respectful. Um, 
that we were concerned about that. I was also, so I did some research on it, and I'm not happy with what I discovered, which is from the Citizen Advocacy Center, which told me that um, if we try to, they call it a niceness policy. A niceness policy is unconstitutional. People can get before the board and they can literally be rude. They can express their opinions. They can express innuendos. Uh, they can, we are a public body and we have to sit and listen. Now whether we respond is up to the, the board chair, whether we respond. But they have the right to do that and we have to listen. Um, on the other hand, we don't have to record it all and review it in our minutes. Uh, everything that I found on the minutes was that this is a business meeting and all we really have to record in the minutes regarding visitors is Mr. So-and-so spoke and in favor of SROs or so-and-so spoke against SROs. And we had one set of minutes that came in that were like that. And I thought that we had turned a, an important corner but recently, as I looked at some of them, and some of them that we're looking to approve tonight, it's the same thing. Uh, there's paragraph and paragraph of personal comments, and some of them are positive. Um, pages of pointing out their opinions of certain people and their actions. And what I'm saying, they have the right to say it, but we don't have to record it. In fact, Robert's Rules of Order, which we should be following, says you only report in the minutes what is said and what is done by the board. That's all you need to report, because this is a business. And I'm looking, I guess not a motion, I'm looking simply to follow. And I, I look back when this board was formed, and the comment was that we would follow Robert's Rules of Order, so I'm looking for the minutes to be handled in that. I have no problem with all the rest of the minutes. I think they handled very well, and I applaud Aaron for doing that. But under visitors, I think he's working much harder than he needs to. Now, if someone at some point needs to go back and look at things that were said by visitors for whatever reason, they're recorded someplace, but they should not be in our business document. That's my opinion, and I'm welcome to it. Well, in retrospect, the minutes uh, that we have have been uh, looked at in the way that it's been reported for a long time ago. And it was adequate the way we were doing it. Uh, sometimes uh, too much information. And uh, let me clarify where we haven't had our own policy regarding anything that's when we look at robert's rules of order not that we it's generated by robert's rules of order and it's the same it's the same with the city the way it is the policy is written uh, that you follow robert's rules of order when you have nothing else to follow okay um also, we're actually using Robert revised Robert's rules of order, but you did get, um, I think, in your package, they, they got the same information, right? You got um, the rules, Robert's rules of order excerpt, and then the public comment and minutes section of the essential work of the Vermont School Board Association, and then the Vermont Statute Online that discusses what minutes. Um, should include. And um, Peter's right, we do have a recording of it, which we keep for probably ever, huh? <laughs> Electronic, digi digitized somewhere forever. Is that correct? I mean, we're not like recording over stuff. We just have new no, it's just, it's just <laughs> um, Right. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, so, does anybody on the board have any opinions on this that they'd like to share? Commentary? Opinions? I do. You can grab that. Yep. Absolutely. So, as I was looking back at the board meeting minutes, I do feel it's important to say. So, I, I'm looking at all the, the, like just the number of sentences. And there were a lot of people that spoke at the last meeting at the FBFA and the tech center. There was a, a lot of people that spoke. I do feel like it's, a, it's important for us to 
at least get a sense of what people are saying. I think it's important for the public to know what people are saying. And yes, they could go back to the YouTube video and look at all that. But I, I feel like it is important, you know, we don't have to go into a detailed discussion, but at least um, re recording what the people are, you know, kind of what the subject is that they're talking about. Thank you. Anyone else? Commentary? Thank you. The sound of silence. <laughs> Hi, Al. Um, I, this is Joanna. Um, I, I guess I feel like this is part of a larger conversation um, that we have begun back when Grant brought up how do we respond to visitors and whatnot. And I just think that this is part of a larger conversation. I don't know that um, I'm ready to make a decision about one aspect of it that Peter brought up. P Peter did his research and that's great. I think I need some time to think about it, but I also just think that it's, um, it has to do with our overall communication with our community and how we do that, um, how we do that verbally, how we do that through outreach and how we respond to comments that have been um, made, whether it be through the mail or through um, you know, coming, coming to meetings. And so I just think that we need to have more of a conversation about that. Can I, can I stop you, Peter, I for a second? Sure. Could you, can you read an excerpt of something that you're doing? Well, it's, it's not, it might not be any particular, as I said, constitutionally, I, I take objection to nothing particular. I take objection to the, the length and breadth of the, of the summary under visitors. Uh, on, for example, on August 18th, there is basically a full typed page of visitors' comments. Um, and I understand they have the, every right to say it. I, I, like I said, I don't doubt that, but I do doubt that we need to record it in a business meeting. And that's my point. And I could go back. There were some, in fact, the board had mentioned at one point that is there any way we could control it? And I'm here to tell you, we can't. We can't control the what they say you can control how long they stay it. Uh, and I spoke to people in the uh, uh, Secretary of State's office and they agreed that you can control how long they say it and we can't control what they say, but we can certainly control what becomes part of our official minutes. Can I understand better what your intention, I just wanna make sure that I'm clear on understanding the why. I understand the why is just to make the minutes more business light because we are a business and when you read it now sometimes it's almost a narrative and it shouldn't be it should be in the minute should be uh the motion that was made um the vote in other words where did what business was done and i think they i read a couple places where they say it should record what was done not necessarily what was said and that's the whole idea of a business and we are a multi-million dollar business and i just think that that's part of it and I understand we want to be user friendly. I get all that, um, but I think I guess I don't see the harm in following. Peter, let me yeah. Clarify. Go ahead. We, we are not a business. We are a public domain, and therefore, in the minutes, it's got to include not only who uh, made the motion, but who seconded. The motion so that at any time if we come under uh, the uh, problem of the open meeting rule that uh, the identity of the people that we're speaking is there i i totally agree with that miss corey i have no problem with that whatsoever in fact every time someone makes a point of order that should be included as well I think. Well, the, if you're going to expand the uh, information that you're giving out, yes. 
So, um, yep. So, um, both Peter and Joanna, thank you for answering those questions because I wasn't really sure what you were talking about or what you were um, concerned about. I do feel like as a, as a school board and that engaging the community, it is important that we have some of this discussion in the minutes because I feel like if we don't have some of that discussion in the minutes, it feels like we're trying to hide something, you know, or make it more difficult for people to get the information that they're looking for. And certainly maybe it could be shortened up a little bit, but I do think that um, we need to be um, reflecting what the visitors' concerns are. I think we need to hear it, and I think we can just say that I don't think we need to I looked at some of the older minutes, and in some cases, there were three or four pages of minutes from one person. So I'm saying that's crazily, obscenely long. It doesn't have to be that way. That's my point. I, I could state their name and what they were in favor of or against, but I don't think you need to get into the other stuff, if you want. <laughs> it is easy. I can see why someone invented the microphone. <laughs> so uh, when we, we had a conversation about this, I had a conversation with Bill about this a while in the last week or so. Um, and I, I've been around long enough to remember when we used to have to go to the central office and come through the minutes to find who said what, when, and what was the vote in order to determine some act, you know, some action or some recourse to an action. I also remember needing to look at who made the first and who made the second to determine whether or not you could do a recall on a, on a certain vote. And, you know, because there's a lot of the Robert's World stuff that gets in there. But I think the real thing that I, I'm concerned about is that, first of all, we're elected board at the will of the community and the community is coming to speak to us. And I would like to record at least what their comments are. And I appreciate that it's not a transcript. You know, we have to be careful. That's a, a delicate balance between recording minutes and recording the transcript of what happened. And I think every minute taker on the planet, and we struggle with this even where I work, you know, like it, how do you get the right balance of putting the right information in without overstating it in one way or another. So having said all that, I think Joanna, you brought up a good point that this might be part of a bigger conversation. And while I agree that our policy says that we don't respond to comments that are made to us in real time, we should take the comments that our community makes and make note of them and come up with a method to address them and you know like tonight there was a, a commentary about the equity committee and i think our presentation sort of helped explain what all happened because when i heard we dropped the equity committee i went uh oh that, you know because i was like i clutched on that and i actually sent him the, the i gave him the, the italian eye because i'm like what the heck but because I didn't really understand where that was going. So I think we take our cues from our board, our, our community members too, as to how to respond. I don't have an answer. I mean, this is the will of the board and how we want to proceed. Um, and, you know, do we hang out with, with three sets of minutes that aren't quite approved yet while we have our next retreat and, and see if we get, get any, I mean, we're not in danger of anything by not having approved minutes, are we? I don't think we have any business that we took action on that is going, I mean, the action happened, right? We approved them for recording purposes. Well, could I ask why couldn't we approve the minutes? It, make a change at the same, like, the minutes aren't going to change. Right. They are what they are for now. I understand we may be directing that they look different moving forward. Okay, that's a good point, yes. Yeah, good point. Good point. So, Jack. So. Hang on. Uh, yeah. Now I know why they invented the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> it was after the bass guitar. <laughs> so, my question is, I personally uh, probably don't read the minutes as, as I should or whatever. I'm not that, I don't really care about, you know, 
I think the people who have done the minutes, Aaron, at this juncture, does a great job with it. So, but since there's a concern, I think we need to ask our attorney, just my opinion, you know, what what is the legality of, of minutes? You know, what should we have? What don't we need? You know, whatever, get an opinion. And the school boards association. Um, I think the group that you asked uh, it is a group that will want anybody coming to any meeting saying anything. Uh, that's kind of a, mm -hmm. that's kind of their, and I like them, but they're kind of, you know, a little bit off the wall at times. I, I got that. So, so <laughs> talking to the school boards association, you know, what, and I think there's something in our policy about uh, public comment where we don't want somebody coming in and talking about a student or somebody coming in and saying something right. about a teacher or about the superintendent or about Jack McCarthy on the school board or you know, yes. a personal thing. Correct. And so that shouldn't be. So uh, whether that's uh, you know, what Peter said in his research is somebody can come and say anything. I don't think that's true. I think there's, they can talk about an issue and their point of view, but not about a person. If they have an issue with a person, they should call the principal of the school or call the teacher themselves or call the superintendent or whatever and deal with a personal thing. But that shouldn't be an open point my opinion, and I think there's a policy that we have. I have to research it. But so you, you do have a document in your packet that the BSBA uh, has a statement about it oh, okay. in their essentials uh, work for Vermont. Yeah. We should only pass one. Right. Oh. So can you pass, the, pass it to Joanne? I, I don't need to repeat that. So that was the reasoning for my question earlier, and my question to Peter was, what was his motivation in doing this. So those are two different, I'm hearing two different motivations. Are we looking for brevity or are we looking for <clears throat> censorship? Because <laughs> if we're looking to censor people, then I'm not for that and I, that shouldn't be a part of this. If we're looking for brevity to you know, reduce the, the work, I, I, I would agree. I don't think you need to have, it's not supposed to be a transcript. It's not a process recording, you know, but, if we're trying to eliminate certain information because it's disturbing or concerning, then I'm, I'm not. Can I snap you to agree with you? <laughs> that is exactly what I'm looking for. Gravity. I in no way looking for censorship. Okay. I, 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 as I said, I don't think we have the power to do that. I'm looking for brevity. Nor, nor would we want to. I agree. Oh, right. <laughs> okay. I think we got more conversation now on this end. <laughs> And <laughs> so what I was going to say in regards to Jack, Jack's point was we have a lot of community members that don't necessarily know the rules. And, and so if we, I think that if we do have people coming, I hate to say this, Nilda, but that are talking about, you know, teachers by name or the superintendent or students by name, then that's where we can't not allow them to talk, but if they start talking in that manner, that's when, as a chair, I'm assuming you would shut it down. Yeah. Because there are a lot of people who just don't know the rules. Yeah. And, that, you know, I didn't know the rules before I started this. And, right. you know, and unless someone's been talking at a school board meeting, or board meetings, I'll say. People don't necessarily know the rules. And I think we just need to recognize that. Yep. Thank you. So, all right, where are we? Thank you. Um, so, I think um, somebody said it. Was it? Was it Alicia or something? We can we can go ahead and approve the minutes as they are submitted for now and continue this discussion. And maybe we can incorporate it in our um, communication discussion at our retreat. Okay. Is that something you can? Yeah, we can add that. You can uh, help bake it in. Yeah. Is the request about legal or BSBA is that appropriate? So the no, no, we haven't. Uh, we haven't. Uh, it's not the yet. 
We did approve the consent agenda, Al. I had requested that and we move those two items to a different location because of the issue of wanting to have the discussion about the minutes before we actually approve these minutes. And maybe that was premature on my part because we could have approved the minutes and still had the discussion. I was trying to do both things. So, Nilda, can I, so I guess I'm a little confused. So it sounds like it was just, uh, Mr. Delore just wanted to simplify the, the notes, not, we're not looking to take important things out or censor anybody. So what, what further discussion is needed uh, about the notes? I mean, is it, is it just as simple as maybe getting some examples of other notes from, you know, the, the other meetings and seeing if we can, you know, cut down on um, the, the length of the notes? I, I'm a little confused on what else discussions are we, we need. Well, the longer we talk about it, we can all get confused, but um, I'm going to um, I'm going to turn over to Bill here for a second. For give me a little bit. Yeah. So let me give you a process just so you know how this happens. Aaron types up the minutes usually yeah. within 24 hours and I review them. Mm -hmm. So uh, we could try something and I'm putting a proposal on the table is that we could try to get them the comments, make sure we don't lose the essence of the comment, but get them shorter. And the board could give us feedback on how we're doing for that. And I would be glad to take that role for you. What I do not want to do as your superintendent, because I'm not a board member, is be editing things out or uh, taking away the ability to change how you want your minutes to be. But I'm willing to take, to work, kind of like, an, I always think of right back to what John said at the beginning, in a design cycle, I'll, as I work with Aaron on that, try to get some more brevity in it, not lose the essence of what people said, you can give us feedback based on what we did, if that would work. I'm just trying to move us along. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah. sounds great. So, <clears throat> thank you for that. Um, <laughs> so, for the record, I haven't had any problem with, with the minutes, except when there's, if there's been an error and we have to correct a date or a time or something. And we've all approved these minutes over time. So I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to do here in this discussion is respect that we had a board member come up with a situation that we needed to address. And that's what we're doing here. Um, I think we can go back to the plan of when we get to 5A and B, we can approve the minutes and we can take either take Bill's proposal or leave it or come up with a new one or discuss it at the retreat or what do you guys want to do? I like Bill's proposal. Move that we leave the minutes the way they are. They aren't that long, 99% of the time. We've been under a couple of uh, times where a lot of people have said a lot of things and it required some sort of uh, verification. So, but the minutes, the way they, we've been doing them for years has been not a problem. Okay, so this was um, warned as potential action. So we do have a motion. Do we have a second? What's the motion? Well, yeah, it's the motion to take Bill's suggestion and that No, the motion is to leave them as the way they are. Well, no change. So is that a motion to accept the minutes that we've had piling up? Or is that a motion no, to No, I think he's looking at the bigger issue. For the future. Future. <laughs> Al, restate your motion, please, so for clarity. I move that the, uh, the minutes be kept the way they have been over the years. The only difference has been sometimes when they've been extremely long, but that's a rarity. So I move that we leave them as they are and let the note taker decide how much and what they are going to put in it. So Al made a motion for a status quo, basically. Is there a second for that motion? If I second it, can we have a discussion? Absolutely. I'll second. Okay, we have a second. Now we need discussion. I just want to say I think that it's important to keep the essence yeah. of the notes. 
So however it's done, I feel like we need to keep the essence of the notes in, in the minutes. Okay, you can move the table, okay. right? Huh? I can move the table. Can I have say something? The right thing to do here. I feel like this is the board getting in the weeds of administrative yeah. function. At this point, yeah. we're overstepping what our role is, and it's up to the superintendent and his staff and team to determine what's appropriate for the minutes. I'm going to disagree, and this is exactly, these are our minutes, it, these do not belong to the superintendent, this is our meeting, this is not the superintendent's meeting, or the staff. So Peter, just to clarify, I wasn't suggesting that it's, it, it, it is our meeting, right. but this is his team and his staff to direct as he chooses to do their jobs. I don't want to direct how the job function of any individual employee is done, that's what I'm saying. I understand, and also the irony of me trying to be do gravity and taking 45 minutes. <laughs> I know. Is it locked? Very well. And people are walking out. I just, I just dismissed them. I said, uh, you guys go, you guys work tomorrow. Morning. So, so sleep. Okay. I mean, we can discuss this to. We can discuss this to death. I want every we, word in the minutes that Peter has said. Or we can. We have a motion on the on the table that we can either pass or kill. Um, and take a roll call. Yeah. I think we should. I think we should just take a vote. We have a vote, to, and I don't want. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it's basically leave things the way they are. Is what Al has made a motion for, and Susan, you seconded that. So we've had our discussion. Peter. No. Jack. No. Nina. Yeah. Alicia. No. Katie. No. Joanna. No. Susan. Yay. Grant. No. Al. Yay. Okay. So. We have four, four yays and six nays. Make sure you get the half. Yeah. So. Um, one, two, three, four. Did you the, ha the halves canceled each other out. Okay. So um, one, two, three, four. What the heck? No, did you go? I did. Okay. One, two, three, four. Oh, okay. And two, three, four, five, six. So three and a half, yay, and five and a half, nay. So motion failed. Yeah. Okay, so Mr. Kimball made a suggestion for a process. How do we do we, we, we want to uh, consider that process for the future and move back on our agenda and, and vote on our minutes. Let, let's try the process that our superintendent suggested. Does anybody? I'll make uh, that motion. I'll second. Thank you. Want to discuss that? <laughs> please, please say no. Do it quickly. Please say no. I, I, I don't want to discuss it, but I do. I do think that there's a different conversation that we could have in our retreat. And I think you're That's right. Fine. I think you're absolutely right. And I think we're kicking the can a little bit here yeah. to do all this. But so we have a motion to um, I'll let Bill come up with a good plan here. Peter. Yes. Uh, Jack. Yes. Nina. Nina. Yes. Thank you. Alicia. Yes. Katie. Yes. Joanna. Yes. Uh, Susan. Yes. Grant. Yes. Al. Thank you all. I think you know how that ended up. Okay. Thank you, Bill. You have a big task ahead of you. <laughs> Um, okay, now we're up to item 7D, Title One. Yep. It's a policy revision adoption Point notice. Order. Don't we have to do the consent and done in minutes, or no? It's, I moved it to after this. So after seven. After okay. seven D. Okay, thank you. Yep. So on. Um, <clears throat> 
So Title I policy revised adoption notice. Mr. Mul uh, John Muldoon is going to review this. But just so you know, the administration is seeking a motion to give notice of its intent to adopt the amended Title I policy per federal requirement for receiving grants. A school board shall give public notice of its intent to adopt a policy stating the substance of the policy, proposed policy, at least, at least 10 days prior to its adoption. Adoption, adoption will take place at the next board meeting. Does someone like to make that motion so we have this discussion, please? So moved. Thanks, Al. Is there a second? Thank Thanks, Jack. Do you want me to bring this to John? Yeah. Yes, please. Can you pass it? Give me back his computer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just happy no one's dropped it. Oh, God. <laughs> Check the circuit. Can you see mine? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, uh, thankfully, this will be much faster than the earlier presentations. Um, but so, the school district is required to adopt a uh, parent engagement policy through our participation in Title I. Um, and as part of that policy, we're also required to have a parent involvement uh, compact. And so, it, it's a little bit of a balancing act because the language is either recommended or prescribed by um, the government for us, but we're also required to engage the community and in, in feedback on what it should say. Um, so I, I had um, a, a, a publicly scheduled meeting where um, anyone that was interested could um, come and hear about the proposed policy and talk about parent engagement at Maple Run. Um, I had several people who expressed an interest and um, as part of that also wanted to find out about Title I, so I did a brief review of the uh, consolidated federal programs and grant money that Maple Run receives. Um, actually, though, only <laughs> very low participation, if I'm being honest, in, in that meeting. And then uh, several people who wanted to attend couldn't on that night. So I had some follow up meetings um, with them. And in general, we made very minor edits to the compact uh, based off the feedback, um, in some cases, because of what we were required to have in it. Um, and then in other cases, because the feedback in general was more around um, uh, the types of communication that are, are helpful. And that is certainly feedback that I'm going to meet with and provide to the, the principals and that uh, Dr. Kimball and I will talk about for the, for the district, but wouldn't really go in either our policy or our, our compact. So the language that here, um, the major changes really just were to honor the uh, desire for additional simplicity in language. Um, as compared to the uh, the original document. Thank you. Sounds good. Any questions? Thank you. <laughs> All right. Hearing no questions, I think we're ready to take a vote on that motion. Peter. Aye. Jack. Aye. Nina. Yes. Yeah. Alicia. Yes. Yeah. Katie. Yes. Yeah. Joanna. A. Susan. Yes. Grant. Yes. Al. Nilda, yeah. Nilda says yes too, so that was a unanimous. So we'll we'll be looking at that at the next meeting. All right. So now I'm moving back to our amended agenda. So what we have consent agenda items number five A and B, which were moved to seven uh, E, I guess. Um, so I need a motion to either approve the consent agenda or take specific items out for discussion. So moved. Motion. I just, if nobody want, if nobody objects, we're going to just yeah. accept the consent agenda. Yeah. Sorry, we got into a little <laughs> crazy, <laughs> a little crazy there for a second. Thank you, consent agenda. All right, I need a motion to approve the warrants. Administration needs a motion to approve the warrants, acknowledging that passage of this motion will act as individual board members participating remotely. Authorized authorization of their signature on these warrants. That sentence needs to be fixed somehow. But motion to approve the warrants, please. So moved. So moved. Susan and Al. Any discussion? All in favor? No, oh God, no. 
Uh, Peter. Aye. Jack. Aye. Nina. Aye. Alicia. Aye. Katie. Aye. Joanna. Aye. Susan. Aye. Grant. Grant. Yes. Al. Nilda says yes. Warrants are approved. Yay. Okay, superintendent's report. Okay. Nothing further. I yes. talked enough today. <laughs> Unless okay. you have questions. Any board announcements? Yes. Okay. Mark up So there's a, there's a senior at BFA who is from Fairfield, I must say, who's running cross country and she just um, set two course records in the last, took first place off, obviously, and set two of uh, records, course records, for her last two runs, and her name is Logan Hughes, and she's to be watched out for. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, pretty amazing. Right. Great. Any other announcements? Why didn't I put ball under the light? First night. Yes. Thanks, Al. Um, also, just a, a reminder that we have a retreat next week, and you have some homework to do in advance. All right, we need, um, we are going to talk, oh, we need to talk about items for future agenda. We still have the implicit bias training, the anti-racism training, recovery update, five-year plan, and the IT study. Anything else? Uh, Can I make a suggestion? Yeah. What? That this, that the board consider the envisioning plan. You don't need to make the decision, but start considering the envisioning plan as the five-year plan. Five -year plan. Agreed. It's really the direction setting for our district, and that's why I wanted you to see that for our retreat and see the linkages. Hopefully, hopefully you're starting to see yep. pieces come together and connecting the dots. Yep. Can I ask that we put a timeline for expectation around the anti-bias, implicit bias training? Exactly what I was just going to say. Um, we yeah. have we have homework assignments for the retreat. Maybe that's something we could assign. Again, I don't know, but if we could just put a time frame. I would be more than happy to. I mean, it would not have, but I'll be happy to do it. It just put links on there, and people can just do it in the comfort of their own homes, you know. And check it off. And, and check mm -hmm. it off. Yeah. That, yeah. Can we use the board? So um, awesome. Can we? They need to go through the central office and get sent to us, though. So Phil, so can they go on the next agenda? Though? We could talk about it. Um, but we just meet. There is an we're implicit making movements and other things, but we're not right making on movements the, on the things that are on there. So we need to complete I've those tests. Yes, so, um, well, let's do this. Let, let's let's agree that we need to put timelines on these, okay? And then we can figure out the details around them a little bit. Does that work? No, I'm actually confused by that. I'm confused that, that, that Peter gets to have something in the agenda, and this has been on our agenda for months now, and we haven't made a commitment to do it. But, but you're asking as an individual board member to come up with websites that you're going to send to all of us that aren't really going through the central... I'd be more than happy to send it anywhere that... Well, so what I'm actually asking is that this item goes to the actual agenda where we can vet what those different options yeah. are and be presented by central office or just district office around what that is going to look like. I just would like to see it on a meeting in the next month. How would that work for you, Joanna? Fantastic. Okay, so let's, um, is that the will of the board? It is. Mm -hmm. Everybody seems to be in agreement. Okay, so... Let's explore the um, opportunities for our implicit bias training at, at, on the agenda for the next meeting. Set timing, set timing. Can I make one last thing? Oh, yes, sorry. So, I don't want the boys to feel left out, but the boys' cross country team is also doing an outstanding job this year, and they won the, the Essex Invitational League. Thank you. Um, okay, now we need uh, um, we need to have a motion to move into executive session related to the SRO contract because premature public knowledge would place the board committee at a substantial disadvantage due to negotiations of the contract. Who would like to make that motion? Second. I guess Al made the motion and Alicia seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 I'm going to take that as a roll vote. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we need to go into executive session. Who do we need there, Bill? My son. 
Will there be action? No. 